In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to Devotion to Christ, Anglican Spirituality, a tradition for today. As always, we are your hosts. I am Dr. Matthew Hoskin, Professor of Christian History with Davin and Hall, and I am joined by my brother. I'm Jonathan Hoskin. I am Archdeacon of Brandon in the Anglican Church of Canada. I serve uh, Two Point uh, Parish congregations at uh, Redeemer Lutheran and St. George's Anglican in Brandon and St. Luke's Anglican and St. Paul's United in Surris, Manitoba. So I'm here with you, my brother, right now. And you know what's been going on in my house a lot recently? Um, my son has really taken a shining to How to Train Your Dragon. And uh, there has been so much How to Train Your Dragon in my house recently. But, uh, you know, interesting, the idea of training a dragon is not a, a foreign thing to the Christian life. And, and in fact, in part, it's kind of what we are talking about always on our podcast. I know we're interrupting sort of our regular flow of working our way through the Lord's Prayer for this, but um, but the the idea that that um, you know maybe maybe there's a dragon that needs to be trained right here. Uh, maybe there maybe I'm looking at two of them right now on my computer screen. Um, one of which is me, and the other is you and and not that it's the first time i've ever called you a dragon um you know all the all the years growing up and all of the names that were <laughs> called i'm sure dragon was in there somewhere i'm um, sure but what we're talking about is is growing as followers of jesus uh, disciples of the lord and and so not sort of sort of going beyond not just being Christians in name, but being disciples of Jesus in in a way that uh, that we're we're developing um, through meaningful engagement with the spirituality of the church, particularly the Anglican Church. Um, but but I think I think there's there's a point at which um, for those of us in sort of secular careers in the world uh are are in some ways we have uh, a privilege and in some ways we have an extra extra challenge um all all of this opportunity though right um because of it against people who choose their religious life and uh as far as you know training that dragon goes and and so i it's just got me thinking about how you have this course coming up. And so I wanted to, I thought it would be an opportunity for us to talk about, talk about your course a little bit and, uh, and let people know what you're teaching. Um, and, uh, so, so tell us about your course because it's about the religious life, right? Yes. So my course is not how to train your dragon. At least. No, it's not. Um, but it is ultimately, it's the history of monasticism from St. Antony in the early 300s through to about the Reformation era. The last text people are going to read will be selections from the Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. But one of the things that is running through the spiritual theology of the monastic movement that you'll get to look at in this course with me is, of course, the taming of the passions. Mm -hmm. um, and so we will be spending time looking at spiritual theologians like um, John Cassian and Evagrius of Pontus, um, who do talk about the things, um, the eight sort of deadly vices or eight deadly thoughts that invade your mind that become the great temptations and eventually get whittled down into the seven deadly sins by Pope Gregory the Great, who himself, in fact, was a monk before he was Pope. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that sort of underlies it because that is the whole point of the mass monastic movement is having the telos of the end. Yes. Having the end of seeing God and realizing though, to be able to get there, you have to have purity of heart. Mm -hmm. And so to attain the proximate goal of purity of heart in order for the final end of the beatific vision of God, 
the passions need to be tamed so that we can focus on him. And so the course is going to do some of the spiritual theology stuff in the readings, but at the same time, we're also going to look at the movement, how institutionalized monasticism sort of arises in Egypt and Palestine, Syria in late antiquity and sort of spreads through the Mediterranean world and then across sort of all of the Christian world into Northern Europe and Britain and Ireland and all of that. Oh, so you're saying there were even monastics in the Isles. Is that what you're saying? Um, that is that is what I'm saying. Indeed. Um, I am shocked and amazed to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you are. I'm. <laughs> um, yes. So we're going to spend a bit of time in the British Isles. Um, in terms of readings, you're actually going to read one of my favorite texts, sort of that's the part of the joys of being the prof is you get to choose um, one of my favorite texts, which is the life of St. Columba by Adam Nan, St. Columba, who is a missionary in Scotland, but also a monk and who was given by the king of the Picts. So he's, technically it's Pictland in that time, if you really want to care, um, and was given um, an island called Iona to found a monastery on, which became his base of operations throughout the Isles yeah. and throughout Scotland for the mission work and the conversion of the people there. And Iona, for our own Anglican history, is actually an important thing because the missionaries don't just, they don't sit around and say, oh, can't go south of the, south of the Tweed, that's England. Right. Uh, in fact, King Oswald, King St. Oswald, we should call him, of Northumbria, spent a period of time in his childhood on Iona in a sort of exile um, because of sort of various political things in the north of England. And when he came back to claim his kingdom as an adult, as a Christian, he called forth uh, monks from Iona to come um, to be the main source of the evangelism of Northumbria. So the, the most famous of those who Oswald called is Aidan. So St. Aidan, Irish monk from Iona, who founded the abbey at Lindisfarne Priory off the coast of Northumbria in England. So, yeah, that's sort of the origins. That's sort of the northern origins in Britain for monasticism and evangelism going hand in hand, which is one of the things that I think is a really cool thing for those of us who have a more evangelical background coming mm -hmm. to monasticism is that you you might have this idea that, hey, monks is all about being alone and just yourself and you don't care about the salvation of others is how many of these monks were and to this day are missionaries that their their alleged inward turn to self is actually a turn to find god and uh, there's this english mystical text from the 1300s called the cloud of unknowing and one of the points it makes is if you've been doing all that mysticism stuff obviously this is a paraphrase they don't talk that way if you've been doing all the mysticism stuff and you don't come away with a greater love for other humans you you've failed you've done it wrong yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, and I find it so, so uh, interesting that, and, and I mean, so true to my experience as well, that um, you're, you're talking about, you know, taming the passions and, and, um, you know, living in a world where, where people are told to embrace their passion and to pursue their passion and, um, you know, Christian spirituality actually tells us to test that kind of thing. Um, there's, and, and I think, I think I'm not the only one, um, but I can't tell you, I can't give you a reference right now off the top of my head, but the, uh, but I'm sure I didn't coin it. Um, but the, but when we talk about how virtues and vices are sort of, um, proper use or misuse of the same um desires within us and our loves become our lusts so easily uh when when they become about self-indulgence and and uh and our passions um are the disordered um pursuit of of these things god has put in us and and to call them instead our affections the the affections of our heart the we're people who live by love um and and it's not not about passion um it's about affection it's about a deep and abiding 
way of life, not about, um, you know, in this moment, this is, this is the thing I've got to do. Uh, and before, before the passion dies down, <laughs> um, but this is, this is, I have set my course and this is what my life is about, um, to pursue it with affection. Um, in, indeed, these are the affections of my heart rather than the passions. The passions are disordered. Um, and, and so, well, but you, you sort of, uh, piqued my interest there. Um, as well, talking about talking about missionaries, monks who are missionaries, and so on, and and um, I mean, this monasticism and and the monastic way, uh, really, in in because we're here to not just talk about monasticism. That's your course coming up, but to talk about the Anglican spirituality, uh, monasticism is writ so strongly into. Anglican spiritual tradition, so many, so many monastics became parish clergy um, because parishes needed clergy and the monastics were, were, you know, the, from the, from the Abbey down the road, um, there's that guy and he's really good. Let's get him. Um, and, uh, and just uh, just the way I, I wonder, can you talk a bit about legacy within within our tradition? Um, yeah, sure. Of, of monastic influence. Yeah. So there is there is a legacy of, of and fascinating living legacy of monasticism within Anglicanism, which may come as a surprise because something like eight hundred monasteries, priories, friaries, and whatever were destroyed or dissolved at least during the Protestant Reformation in England. So you sort of think, when you think Anglican and monastery, you also think dissolution. Uh, right. That's kind of a big deal in the 1530s. And for, for centuries after that, there were no Anglican monasteries. The Church of England had no monasteries of its own. But what they, were tr what they wanted to do was to take aspects of the spiritual life, not just of monks, obviously to be like a technical historian they're also bringing in other things going on in cathedrals with secular canons and whatever but make that the life of the religious mm. right the life of the people who have taken formal vows of one sort or another whether they're secular clergy monastics or canons or whatever and make that available to all of the lay folk of england mm -hmm. um, and so you so you do that by translating the liturgy into the english language by translating the Bible into the English language and getting it into every parish in England. And England has this extraordinary parish network that is actually a really cool thing that is was helped out by the monks, right? Mm -hmm. um, that you have your monasteries and your parish churches, and oftentimes you do indeed have monastic priests who sort of their church is the parish church. And so then that, our, our liturgies, the structure of the Book of Common Prayer for morning and evening prayer is you would say at a, in, in a formal sense, it comes from the cathedral use of late medieval England, la di da, blah, blah, blah. But if you keep tracing those roots back, you will find out, well, at what point did someone say morning prayer begins with, Oh Lord, open thou our lips and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Oh God, we speak to save us. Lord, make haste to help us. You discover that's monastic. Right. Why right. do you do the vanity? The Magnificat, the Nunc Dimittis, at the places in the liturgy you do, that's monastic. Yes. Why do you have a desire to work through the entire book of Psalms? Right. In terms of point of origin into the daily office, once again, that's monastic. Um, I just finished my la my course last term for Davenant Hall was about the origins of Christian worship. And one of the things that I talked about in that course is the fact that Monks are taking what everyone else is doing and sort of going harder and are sort of when we have our evidence from guys in the second and third centuries before the rise of the monastic movement, there was no idea that your ordinary lay Christian would ever be expected to sing the entire book of Psalms. That's right. just not an expectation, partly because most people are illiterate, right? Mostly it's sort of, can you do the Lord's Prayer? Memorize it. 
and then memorize a few other psalms for certain times of the day or certain circumstances. And that's what your daily office is. And then you bring your own petitions from your own heart. Yes. Right. The idea that you would do the entire Psalter, which is deep. If you're a prayer book Anglican, that's like, that's your deep thing. And that, although it is becomes part of the world of the secular clergy and the canons, that actually is the thing that we owe to the Desert Fathers of Egypt, to um, Benedict and his rule. Um, and so, and so those sorts of things continue through to us today. So that's part of the legacy of monasticism. Right. Because these things weren't a part of the cathedral use, right? The cathedral use is just what's used in the secular parishes, in essence, um, rather than in the abbeys. And and that, that sort of intent to pray through the full book of psalms and read the full canon of scripture was not a part of those those offices pre-reformation in england right like that's sort of a cran it is there a word cranmerian i, I believe the word uh, is cranmerian. innovation cranmerian sort of... innovation and yeah so what what he do, in, does is enable the cathedral office to get you the whole book of psalms finally because that is an ongoing thing right. To sing in an entire week all of the psalms actually is very difficult if you have duties outside the monastic precinct. This is one of the things, this is part of the story of monasticism in the Middle Ages is the office takes too long. We can't till the fields anymore. So we'll get a bunch of lay brothers to do the work for us so that the real monks can keep singing the office because they don't have time to do the manual labor that is actually stipulated in the rule of St. Benedict as being the like the second most important thing they're only doing the most important thing they anyway so that so that is the thing and so crown was like well look if you know we don't have monks anymore all of our clergy are secular clergy and none of our lay people are clergy and so they have technically even less time if you're going to be out working so how can you get that um deep penetration of the book of psalms in that's sort of what he goes for now, I see that my brother Jonathan appears to be frozen, um, although it's the wrong time of year to be frozen in Manitoba. Nevertheless, let me tell you, it gets cold there in uh, December and January. So, so there is sort of an adaptation of cathedral and monastic use by Cranmer for sort of plowing forward with the Book of Common Prayer. And so we get that. Another thing that I would want to say to Jonathan if he were not frozen right now um, would be, if we're thinking about the Anglican legacy, I have discovered, reading Jeremy Taylor, that a lot of the things he talks about are the same things that the Desert Fathers talk about. Um, so that's just another thing to think about, that the commonalities of our own Christian spirituality and the heritage that we hold within our own Anglican tradition, I think is super important. Um super important for us if we're thinking about what is the legacy of monasticism. We see it in our spiritual writers um, like Jeremy Taylor and William Law. Um, you can see the sorts of and rigor in the Methodist movement as well. In fact, John Wesley, I know, John Wesley uh, himself was influenced directly by monastic writings such as The Imitation of Christ. Of course, The Imitation of Christ written by a monk for, well, written by, eh, technically not a monk, but anyway, written for the Devotio Moderna, for people sort of wider outside of clo the cloistered life, which is a big movement going on in the 14th and 15th centuries, is to help this spirituality get out. Um, but it is an influence upon Methodist spirituality, the sort of clinching text of medieval monasticism um, is an influence there. And, and Methodism, although the, the formal group of persons called Methodists end up splitting away from the Church of England, I would say the spirituality of Methodism is very much in step um, with Anglican spirituality and very much a part of Anglican spirituality in the 18th century. So just to think of another place where there is another legacy of monasticism, I hear noise from Jonathan. So, yeah, um, sorry, I, I my computer kind of froze. OK, well, while your computer was frozen, I was simply going over sort of beyond the office how Jer people like Jeremy Taylor and William Law and others, you can see 
I haven't done the research on them to see if they're using monastic texts as sources, but certainly many of their recommendations are the same ones you would find in late antique and medieval monastics. Um, and then also John Wesley and his reading of the imitation of Christ and early Methodism. So I perhaps am frozen on his computer. So, um, so this little interview about monasticism and Anglican spirituality, not going fully according to plan. I'm just hoping that my computer, which is the one that's doing the recording, is catching me for all of you to enjoy um, later on when this gets posted to the internet. Um, so that's what I'm hoping anyway. I think I'm just going to sort of give you a quick, quick rundown. Um, so that's monasticism. And it, there are other ways in which it has a legacy in Anglicanism. And then, of course, there's the birth of new monasteries and new monastic orders within the Church of England in the Victorian era. Um, and so if you have a Canadian 1962 Book of Common Prayer, you will find that we have the Office of Compline at the back. That is a contribution to the English language liturgical life. In fact, originally by John Mason Neal for a community of nuns um, back in the Victorian era. So the sort of the monastic legacy in Anglican spirituality is an ongoing concern, basically. That's the short version of it. Um, and the roots of the entire monastic movement are what my upcoming course with Davin et al. will be talking about, not just in England, um, but sort of the wider, the wider story. So we'll be seeing the Desert Fathers, we'll be seeing Cistercians, we'll be looking at Mount Athos and the Eastern tradition, um, which has been, I know, influential on both me and Jonathan, as well as a lot of other Anglicans around out there today, um, such as former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, um, to take an example of someone who has had an impact of Eastern Christian spirituality on his life. So I don't know if Jonathan is unfrozen or not. Well, before we go, I would just like to remind you um, to like this, to subscribe, to share it with all your friends, to give us feedback. Um, and if there's something you want to hear us talk about, remember, we're open to suggestions. The next episode, we will be resuming our journey through the Lord's Prayer. We will be looking at the um, Give Us This Day Our Daily Bread. We'll be asking, what does it mean for the bread to be epiusios after all so i don't know if close. i look frozen to you or not you don't look frozen do you could you close with the collect for the 12th sunday after trinity i i can try and hopefully i don't freeze Almighty and everlasting God, who art always more ready to hear than we to pray, and art wont to give more than either we desire or deserve, pour down upon us the abundance of thy mercy, forgiving us those things whereof our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen.